as we begin our 190th year of ministry here at Trinity, we are glad that you are all here to share in this time. My name is Joseph James. I'm the pastor here, and you are, if you're one of our guests, if you are here for the first or second or third time, we are glad that you're here. We invite you to please sign the pew registration pad and pass that down so that we can keep a record of your attendance. Also, that is good for all of us to sign and update as we need to for uh, updates on phone numbers or email addresses or any other relevant contact information. I'd like to share with you a few other announcements, if I may. Our summer Vesper service is uh, happening again this Wednesday night at 6.30 in the chapel. Uh, it was a beautiful service this past Sunday in which it was a chapel full of people and a chapel full of good hymns and communion and proclamation. And we hope that you'll be here this coming Wednesday night at 6.30 in the chapel. We'll be doing Summer Vespers through the middle of August. I believe it's August 16th. Uh, this is a good time uh, to be together with your church family, especially if you're going to be away on the weekends. We would invite you to be a part of uh, our time during Summer Vespers, Vespers this Sunday, this coming Wednesday night. A couple of uh, other announcements. Feed My Starving Children. Uh, we have, as they say, we have paid, we have prayed. Now it's time to play. It's time for the service of what we're doing with Feed My Hungry Children. There is a sign-up sheet still in the back of the church. This is a wonderful way for the churches of our community to gather and come together to serve others, to prepare meals for those unfortunate in the other, par other parts of our world. Uh, that's coming up, I believe, is August 1st and 2nd, so please sign up for those, sheet, those times together. You'll also see uh, Gear Up for Learning, the uh, school supplies that we're doing. Uh, we want to help the children of our community. These are ways that our community, uh, that our church is involved in the ministries of our community. And so we hope that you will help out with school supplies as you are able. I also want to say thank you for those, to those who have helped out with the uh, listing sessions. We had two listing sessions this past week. And there are other ones. If you have not signed up for one yet, I encourage you to do so. These sessions are a time for me to visit with eight or 10 or 12 people just to hear from them, to get to know them a little better, their thoughts and ideas and passion for Christ within our church family. So uh, you'll see that information in the back in the vestibule as well. If you have any further questions, call the church office. But I know that there are openings still most of them are on Monday or Thursday night, so please sign up as you can. Friends, I invite you now to stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord.
lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Your word is our heritage forever, the joy of our hearts. Please remain standing as we join in prayer together with our opening prayer. Living word, holy breath, we have stumbled through the week and groped our way back to this place. Illumine the steps before us and write your word on our hearts, for we carry the name of Jesus and would walk in the light of his love. Amen. This morning for our Psalter, we will use the Canticle of Zechariah. It is on page 208. The choir will be singing the responses at the red R. The congregation's response is in the darker print. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to set the chosen people free. The Lord has raised up for us a mighty Savior from the house of David. Through the holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham.
And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. Now will you please stand for the glory of God. You may be seated when will our children please come forward now for our time together. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Now, you had to make your way up here around something today. What is this we've got right here? What is this called? What is this? You know what this is? Do you know what we do with this piece of furniture here? Do you, we baptize people. That's right, it's called the baptismal font. And you know, I'm the kind of person that kind of looks at things and, and you know, looks under things and around things. And, and I want to show you, it's, it's a metal bowl that we put the water in, right? But, but the other thing is, see, there's this big cabinet that holds the bowl for the water. But look here, it's hollow. There's nothing inside of there. How about that? Now, why, why do we have a font like this? What, what, what happens when we put water on people's? How, how, people, where do we put the water? Do we put it on their elbow? Where do we put it? On their head. On their head? Are you sure? How, do, how does that go? Does, does the pastor just kind of sling it on them like that? I mean, just kind of go whoosh like that? How's that go? How, what's the pastor do? Does he do it? Does he or she do it gently? Do they do it like that? Yeah. Do you remember when you were baptized? You don't? Why not? Were you little? Not that little. You weren't that little, were you? <laughs> you were young, though. You were, you were a baby, about like size of Adeline, I bet. And, and there were all kinds of people around that loved you and cared for you, and, and they stood around, and, and the pastor put water on your head, and they helped you remember that God loves you. That's what baptism means. That's one of the many things it means. Now, today, I have a seashell that I use to help baptize. Turn around for a minute and look that stained glass on the right-hand side at the very bottom. You will see something that looks like a seashell. That is a symbol of baptism. And let me show you another one. When you're walking out, the third window on the right, at the bottom, there's another seashell with water coming out of it. it, over on this side. It's a symbol of our baptism. Our baptism, our baptism is very important because with that, we remember that God loves us and God equips us and God shows us the way through life. And God loves us before we even knew it. When you were a little baby, 
and that water was pouring on your head, God was loving you even then, just like God is loving you now. And as you grow older, you'll learn more and more and more about Jesus and his love. Now, I want to tell you something. Do you think you ever graduate from Sunday school? Do you think you ever graduate from learning about Jesus? No. We are always learning about Jesus. We never graduate from our faith. It is something that, that goes with us and helps us all of our lives. So today, when we are taking time to baptize, I hope you will remember that Jesus loves you too. Let us pray. Thank you, Almighty God, for the many blessings that you have shown us, the ways that you love us, the ways that baptism seals and is a sign for our salvation and your love for us. Go with these children, O oh Lord, as they grow in years. May they also grow in your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for coming this morning. We remind the children ages four through second grade, if you would like to join us in children's church, you may head to the back of the church and you may go with them. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel, the reading of wonderful words of life. We bring the gospel to the center of the people as a visual reminder that Christ came for us all. Hear now the reading of God's word. From Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, as, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Please be seated. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty and gracious God, we are thankful to gather to hear the wonderful words of life. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Whether it's in the first century or the 21st century, people have always wanted to understand who God is and how God works in the world. And as the people gathered around Jesus that day beside the sea, Jesus told a story. He told the story of a sower. A sower is someone who plants seeds, but it's not like you would think. It's this sower, as you could tell by the front bulletin cover, is someone who throws them and helps distribute the seeds in that way. We would expect, you and I, if we were the sower, that we would be careful. We would be measured. We would want to do the job right. We wouldn't want to waste seed. We want to make sure that just the right amount of seed made it in the right place. Because seed in that day, when Jesus was telling the story, and today, seed is an expensive item. And so we would expect that sower to be frugal and measured and careful with the use of the seed. But we also expect that the sower would cast that seed into places where it would grow and do the most good. That would, places that it would produce the greatest harvest. We wouldn't expect the sower to put it any other place. You and I wouldn't put it anywhere else because it is too precious. It is too wonderful to do any less. But here is Jesus telling the story of a sower. And this sower would make John Deere and Massey Ferguson blush. Because this sower is not taking one or two seeds and just placing them carefully. He's getting whole handfuls and just throwing. Scooping and throwing and walking and scooping and throwing and walking and scooping and throwing handfuls of seeds, making it rain seeds. And it's not just in the great places where you would expect the harvest to be great. No, this sower puts it on the rocky ground and on the thorny ground and on the path. If you read this parable correctly, three quarters of the seed goes into wasteful places, what you and I would consider wasteful places, and only one quarter of it goes into a place that we would want to see to go. It's a funny story. We wouldn't do that. What is Jesus trying to tell us about God? What is Jesus trying to tell us about us as human beings and how we relate to God? What is the word here in this unconventional story? Jesus is calling, using what we call a parable. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And usually in the story, people begin to identify the different parts, like the soil. Guess what? You and I are the soil. Now, we would like to say that we're all the good soil. And the people out there that are not going to church, well, you know, they're the thorny soil. They're, they're, they're the path. They're, they're the not good soil. But the thing that I know 
in my own life is that each one of us is made up of all these different kinds of soil. Oh yes, there's a part of us that is abundant and fruitful and God loves so readily and is so proud of us. Ways that we make God's love known in the world, but if the truth be known, my friends, for all that good and kind and loving and generous parts of us, there's other parts of our spirits that we hide in the thorns, that we hide because of guilt and shame. There are places within our spirits that are rocky because of grief or depression. The places of our experience where we're broken, hurting, lost, those are the rocky places. And then, God help us, there are places within our spirits that are like a parking lot, like the floor of this sanctuary, hard and barren. Places that are willful and angry and fearful. Places that we don't let anything penetrate. Now, I don't think that three-quarters of our spirits are the bad places, but we must admit that we all have a rocky place, we all have a barren place, we all have places that we're not proud of within our hearts that are not joyous or fruitful. We are the soil. God is the sower. And God is not sowing just seeds. God is sowing, casting, throwing with wild abandon, love and forgiveness, grace and strength, healing and salvation. Long before we ever knew it, and long after we ignored it, God has been casting that seed into our hearts, into our spirits, into the, the dark places, into the hidden places, into the rocky places, into the hard places. Places that we are ashamed to show the world. The places that don't grow. And yet, and yet, Jesus tells us about the sower who casts freely and abundantly that grace upon that hard soil. Not once or twice, not hundreds or thousands of times, but continually. God is extending grace to us in all parts of our lives. We understand who we are in this parable. We understand our brokenness. We understand the fruitful areas. But why, oh why, is God shown as this sower that sows beyond bounty, that shows beyond measure, that is free, that is joyous? Why does the sower do this? Would we see, could we see the slide for a moment, please? This is a slide given to me by Ginger Harmon of Gaffney, South Carolina. Can you see what it is? It's a sunflower growing in a rain gutter. Why does God cast soil in the, the barren places of our lives? Why does God care and sow seed in the hard places that are hard for, for, for the seed to take hold and the love to take hold? It's because a sunflower can grow in a gutter. You see, my friends, God's grace and God's love can change us. 
Those barren areas of our lives can bear fruit again. The rocky areas of our lives can be bountiful again. Yes, the birds may come along. Yes, the thorns may choke those seeds of the gospel out. But God keeps sowing because God knows that we can be changed, that we can be made different, that a sunflower can grow in a rain gutter, the love of God can grow in the hardest part of your life, in the place that is the most barren and lost and hurting, the place that needs forgiveness, the place that needs healing and love and wholeness. Ginger didn't plant that seed in that gutter. It's my understanding she came back from vacation and found it there. And don't think she's got dirty gutters. No more than you or I do. A gutter is not a place where we would expect a sunflower to grow. But God did. And God is hoping. God is casting. God is throwing the gospel of love and care and grace into the barren places of your life. Because God believes that those places can be redeemed and those places in our hearts can be changed. Wherever we're broken and hurting and sinful and shamed, those places can be abundant again. Sunflowers do grow in gutters. Let anyone with ears listen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, I invite you to stand with me, if you will, and sing the first two verses of Child of Blessing, Child of Promise as the families and those of those who are taking part in the baptism come forward at this time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift, offered to us without price. We invite you now to join us in the singing of the remaining verses of Child of Blessing, Child of Promise, on page 611.
I present Adeline Grace Scott for baptism. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, <clears throat> reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, you may respond with I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, you may respond with, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, you may respond with, I do. Will you nurture Adeline Grace and Christ's Holy Church that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, you may respond with, I will. You may be seated. Congregation, do you as Christ's body the church reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. Amen. My friends, you're about to take another vow. Come with me. A vow that is very important in the life of this congregation. And I want you to see the child, this pretty child, at Trinity United Methodist Church, we don't have no ugly babies. <laughs> Adeline Grace will be looking to you to be her Sunday school teachers, to be her nursery workers, to be her youth group leaders. You're making a covenant vow this day for this child. A vow that will follow her all of her life. And she likes looking at me. And you know what, Adeline? I will do my best too. And so is Miss Angela. And so my friends, I ask you this question. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Adeline Grace before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Adeline Grace and her family with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that these we'll God. Now I invite you, let us join together in professing the Christian faith that is found in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. This morning, as we gather to celebrate this baptism and worship God, we want you to know that the water used this morning for this baptism comes from several places. The first place that it comes from is from the tap here out of the sink. There are other special places that this water comes from. When our confirmands go on their retreat to Lake Junaluska, they take with them 
their water from special places around Sumter, and they mix it with water from other youth groups that have brought it from all over the southeastern part of the United States. It contains water from the River Jordan where Jesus himself was baptized. And today, it contains water from the Santee Dam where Dustin and Rachel uh, shared their first kiss and also where Dustin proposed to Rachel. But it also contains water from Poinsett Park, which is where they were married. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He calls his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and she who receives it. To wash away her sin and clothe her in righteousness throughout her life. That dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Adeline Grace, I baptize you. You're a pretty girl. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now it is our joy to welcome our new sister in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. Members of the household of God, I commend Adeline Grace to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith. Do all in your power to confirm her hope and perfect her in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian baby. love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and in peace. And at this time, Angela has a special word as she takes this quiet and wonderful and beautiful child Many of you may not be aware, but this month, July of 2017, we celebrate 190 years of ministry as Trinity. 
And as we celebrate, we also celebrate this first baptism in our 190th year of ministry. And so we've invited our lively saints to come and sit on the front row, and we have three brave women that claim uh, that title we've given them. But as we sing Jesus Loves Me together, and we ask these lively saints to place a hand upon Adeline and to bless her in the name of Christ, we offer you the opportunity to offer prayers to God for her and her journey of faith. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we gather as God's people today, we are thankful for our baptism, for a time that we can come together. We also want to remember Robert Castleberry as he is having surgery tomorrow. We also offer God thanks for the career of Dustin Smith, who retired as a colonel yesterday, and Kristen Smith, who was promoted to colonel. Both of those, excuse me, were on Friday. And there are other concerns and joys of our hearts as well as our congregation. But my friends, I invite you now to join me in a few quiet moments as we have our morning prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we were yours before we drew breath. And still will we be yours when the pulse of life ceases. In every fragile and reckless moment, we belong to you. We thank you for all the ways you cast your grace upon us. May the love we have received spill gratitude from our hearts. May the wounds we carry open our hearts to the needs of others. May we recognize in your mercy the faithfulness that judges and redeems every human bond. We lift to you now all that seems irreconcilable in our families, in our schools and workplaces, in our nation, in your church, and in your world. We pray for those who identify as leaders in every sphere and field of life, for our President and the Congress and all those whose decisions weigh heavily on others. We pray also, O oh God, for ourselves, for the broken places of our lives, for the hard places where your grace finds difficulty to plant, 
Redeeming God, stake your claim upon us now. Teach us to act, to tend the world you love, to sow more than we reap, to heal more than we wound, to make room for others as you made room for us. These things we ask in the name of the one who redeems all creation. Amen. Now will our ushers please come forward for the dedication of our tithe and offering.
Giver of life, we do not want the cares of this world and the lure of wealth to choke your word among us. As the sower casts seeds abundantly, hopefully so we long to participate in the seeding of the world. Receive these gifts as tokens of our lives. Send your cultivating spirit to work among us until we yield and grow in grace. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who came out of love for the world and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go now into the world, carrying the seeds of the gospel in your hearts, but casting them freely in all the people you meet and all the places you go. Go now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.